I don't want to push my chips forward and go out and meet something I don't understand. That's all we need to know about Anton Chigurh. In the first two scenes, the violence is explicit, but we don't need to understand the why. All we need to feel is the fear of an unstoppable evil approaching right at us, coming closer and closer and closer. In No Country for Old Men, we are either the hunter or the hunted. At any given moment, we can turn into the other. Death is inevitable to both. And the only thing the movie is concerned about is the reaction of a person to his or her death, whether they see it approaching or not. There are spoilers in this video, so please don't deprive yourself by watching this analysis ahead of the movie. The scenes we're going to analyze are the two coin toss scenes. This is where the philosophy or the worldview of the story is explained. We have two attitudes and two results. How are they different? The first coin toss happens the second time we meet Anton Chigurh, who's simply an unstoppable evil force. Study his look. His hair is atrocious, even for 1980, the time period of this movie. He carries a captive bolt pistol, though it would draw as much attention as a bazooka. Then there's the coin toss. Everything about Anton Chigurh is designed to stand out. As a killer, his priority is not to avoid scrutiny, but to express himself to the fullest. He probably considers himself an artist. There's no real mystery to him. We know he's ruthless and able to take advantage of the slightest weakness. We also know he's cold and calculating, but not reckless. He gets caught, but also knows how to escape. Like it was just a minor inconvenience, it doesn't change a thing. We know all this before the first coin toss scene. We know as soon as the proprietor opens his mouth that he shouldn't have. Once he gets Anton's attention, his life is in immense peril. Or at least that's what our gut feeling is. What's the major goal of the scene? As far as I can understand it, it comes down to fate and what we can do about it. Obviously the scene is played out for us. Anton lets the proprietor live at the end and then jokes about it. My personal opinion is he would not have killed the proprietor either way. Simply because in the world this story is based in, Anton Chigurh only kills when it serves a purpose. You going to shoot me? That depends. Do you see me? Killing a proprietor at a gas station wouldn't serve any purpose except maybe amusement. The coin toss itself is irrelevant. He could have tossed the coin anywhere asked anybody to call it. Randomness was his ultimate goal. More importantly, he doesn't toss the coin every time he wants to kill someone. So why would he single out only two instances? In these two scenes, he has the time to play the game, but more importantly, he already knows the outcome. The coin toss is just a message. Your life is in your hands, whether you call or not. It won't change a thing. You're going to die, and not at a time of your choosing, and not in a manner of your choosing. So the first coin toss scene is one half of this message, while the second is the other half. By comparing the two, hopefully, we can see how the Coen brothers use camera angles, blocking, and editing to deliver this message. Both scenes have explicit tension in them. We know because we are aware of events the characters are not. The proprietor is likable, so we don't want him to die. This is not an accident. Carla is also likable, so we don't want her to die too. The gas station coin toss scene runs for about four and a half minutes. I could count about 59 shots at an average shot length of four and a half seconds. There are about seven setups taken in the classic Hollywood system. Long shots, mids, close-ups, and over-the-shoulder shots. The Carla coin toss scene runs for about three and a half minutes, but with only 34 shots at an average shot length of about 6.3 seconds and about 11 setups. It's slower than the first scene. The tension is drawn out more. They can do that because of the first coin toss scene. We know Anton's capable of mercy. What will it be this time? We are very eager to find out, so we will wait a bit longer. In the first scene, we start with an establishing shot in a top angle, and then quickly to a mid or mid-long shot of the proprietor at eye level. Anton steps into the shot, making it an over-the-shoulder shot. In the second scene, we start with an establishing shot from ground level, and have a middle scene where Carla understands somebody has broken in, and she knows who it is and what's in store for her. Then when she opens the door, we are in a mid-over-the-shoulder shot from a high angle. In the first scene, Anton has a solo shot. He's in his own world, doing his own thing. 
the proprietor wants to engage him in banter, so the reverse is an OTS. OTS is classic confrontation in the Hollywood system. Anton is shot from a low angle and gives him a sense of power. From here on out, it's always at a lower angle than eye level. As soon as the proprietor asks his question, it becomes confrontational and the reverse is an OTS as well. The game is on. Notice how Anton answers a question with a question. This is one classic technique to maintain power in a conversation. You avoid directly answering anything. Politicians are experts at this. It doesn't matter what the proprietor asks or says. What Anton is deciding here is, what kind of fun can he have at this man's expense? In the second scene, Anton is almost always in a solo shot. There's no over the shoulder after the first few shots. Anton is directly ready for a confrontation, but Carla is not. She wants to avoid it. She has no fight in her. Instead of trying to run away, she steps inside and takes a seat. After that point, Anton has solo shots only. This is a battle in his mind, and not with Carla. Again, notice how we settle down to a low angle for the remainder of the scene. Carla holds her own in this scene. She asks the questions and doesn't play his game. She's a lot tougher than she looks. From this point on, both scenes have a back and forth. In the first scene, it's all over the shoulder, confrontational by design. So we are instinctively aware something might happen at any moment, but we're not sure. It's an unnerving scene, what? similar to Joe Pesci's How My Funny Scene in Goodfellas. Goodfellas. It throws you off. Then there is a shot size. Anton is bigger in the frame and the proprietor is smaller. On top of that, the Coen brothers pile it on with a slow dolly in when we arrive at the actual coin toss. We are being directed through the use of camera angles and movement. In the second scene, we are sure something is going to happen, but we don't know what. So there is no need to explicitly show the confrontation. We know it is Anton who must make the decision. We are as powerless as Carla and must wait for the inevitable. We want to know Anton's reaction so bad, we want to see his face, which is why he's in the shadows. We shouldn't be able to read him or his body language. That prolongs the tension. In the first scene, the cinematography is bright and cheerful. Anton even smiles midway through. He's already made up his mind here. His face is well lit and clear as day. The reason I say the coin toss is just a red herring is because Carla doesn't play Anton's game. That's probably because she is instinctively aware the game is pointless. Sure, if Anton had pointed a gun at her and threatened her, she might have, but he doesn't. Why not? Even though she doesn't play his game, she still gets killed. Now, it's not shown, but Anton checks his boots for blood, and I think the novel explicitly mentions he kills her. By the way, the screenplay is a very close adaptation of the novel, with only a few changes. So why did Anton kill her if she didn't toss the coin? It means it's not that important anyway. He knew the outcome. The same can be said of the first scene. Anton isn't going to kill the proprietor for sport because that would just endanger his work. The proprietor asking him about his route and destination is a commonplace occurrence. Somebody with Anton's experience and poise would surely not be threatened by it. This is just my opinion, but I believe Anton would have let him go whatever the toss yielded. Once the back and forth ends, both scenes offer relief with a wider shot. In the first scene, we cut back to the mid-long shot of the proprietor. He's okay, and Anton jokes with him. He tells him the coin is special. Now here's the thing. The coin is probably a euphemism for us human beings. If we want to live like everyone else, we can get mixed up in the bunch tossed around like coins. If we believe we're special, we are. We arrive at our destinies through the choices and actions we take. Fate is just what inevitably flows from it. When death arrives, it's going to be random and abrupt, so we better say and do everything before that time arrives. This is what he tells Carla before he shoots her. Well, I got here the same way the coin did. She, like us, are led to believe the coin toss has meaning. It doesn't. It's like a chant in a meditation, something to help you focus on the real thing. What have you done with your life? In his own twisted way, Anton only gives his privilege to people he likes. Do you have any idea how crazy you are? You mean the nature of this conversation? I mean the nature of you. And that's why Anton is flamboyant. That's why he dresses the way he is. The author even made his skin darker so he will stand out even more. I haven't read the novel, but Anton basically does his job to a fault. 
Overall, if you study the movie, the most violent scenes are at the beginning. Towards the end, the violence gets less and less and happens off-screen. In the last scene with Carla, we don't even know if violence happens or not until after the fact. We have to piece it together. The great achievement of the Coen brothers is that nothing changes in the movie. That's true of most of their movies. The characters don't undergo an arc. They just change positions. If other characters had survived and Shigur had died, nothing would change in our understanding of the world view. The confrontations in the movie are all red herrings. Anton doesn't kill Llewellyn, the sheriff doesn't kill Anton, and all he has to look forward to is an unsolved case, retirement, and death. One interesting fact is that none of the three central characters share any screen space together, and Carla is the only one who has met them all. The coin toss is a lie. No Country for Old Men was shot on film with Cook S4 and Ari Master Primes. I believe most of the shots were a 32mm lens, which is Roger Deakins' favorite focal length. The gas station scene was shot at T5.0 with HMIs blasting through the window. The back window had an ND gel. The Carla scene mirrors this, a window on the side and the back, but the lighting is subtle. Carla is lit well, but Shigur is in the shadows. His hands are visible and lit so we know he doesn't have a gun pointed at her. And she can see that too, which probably gives her some hope. The other thing is that they are both wearing black. You could argue that's creating a false sense of affinity, or it's just because she's coming from a funeral and he needs to stay in the shadows. We'll need to ask the Cohen brothers. The way they work, nothing is left to chance. The shots were storyboarded before the shoot, and according to Deakins, only 250,000 feet of film was exposed, which equates to a shooting ratio of roughly 30 to 1. In ultra-low budget terms, that's still a lot, but not according to Hollywood. It is supposedly the first Oscar-winning film to be edited on Final Cut Pro. I hope this analysis has helped you understand to a certain extent how the Coen brothers use blocking and camera movement to tell a story. I've published exclusive notes from this video on Patreon. It also includes the scenes in the screenplay with my annotations and how it was changed for the actual movie, as well as my shot list for both scenes. You'll find the link in the description. As you can guess, the amount of time these videos take to research and put together is considerable, so please support Wolf Crow on Patreon and there'll be a lot more videos like this one. Hit subscribe if you don't want to miss anything and let me know what you think in the comments below. Bye now. You see? やめろ。